record on this computer. All right, done. Uh, yes, thank you to our presenters for responding. The, the, initially, the uh, idea was to get um, a discussion happening at uh, this uh, TASA virtual event about uh, culture and everyday life under COVID. Um, I, I think that one of the interesting things about uh, the pandemic has been how, uh, you know, not a week goes by that we hear about new and interesting or puzzling cultural developments, uh, people baking sourdough. Uh, so there is the claim that people are leaving cities for the countryside. Um, and uh, some of the papers will also be discussing, I think very relevant, what is the role of music? What is the role of um, live performance or the lack of, thereof? and the creative industries in the context uh, of the pandemic. Um, as I was hinting at also a few minutes ago or at the beginning of uh, my comments, uh, as I was welcoming people, um, it's a very unique uh, uh, virtual event uh, for this panel as well that we have people from different time zones. So we have people who will be presenting from the UK, from Israel, or Israel and the UK in the, in the case of the first paper, uh, and the UK in the case of the third paper. And then for the, fin the grand finale, we're going all the way to Denmark. So um, I don't know if it's a first for the Australian Sociological Association, but um, I suppose what we can say that uh, uh, if COVID taketh away, uh, COVID also um, giveth, and um, it is interesting that we can, um, I suppose, uh, try out these new experiments in, in conference configurations. So welcome everyone. Um, I'll jump now straight to our first presenters who I think are speaking very much to the kinds of themes that we were hoping would be addressed in this panel. Uh, they are Tali Katzgero and Neta Jorovic from the University of Haifa in Israel. And the title of their talk is Hol Holidays Celebrated Alone, Languages That Go Unspoken, Continuities and Ruptures in Everyday Cultural Participation in the UK During COVID-19. And just to preempt that uh, the speakers are gonna speak for 15 to 20 minutes. There'll be one or two questions after each presentation. And then if we have time at the end, we can have a more general discussion. So I'll hand it over to Tali and Neta. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this panel. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to meet all of you. Uh, I'm going to share my presentation with you. And today we are reporting uh, research uh, that we're conducting in the UK. Uh, the context is, of course, uh, the recent lockdown um, that started in the UK in uh, late March. Uh, the lockdown included uh, wide ranging restrictions on freedom of movement, um, non essential businesses and cultural venues uh, were closed. Individuals were directed to stay at home, were not allowed to socialize with family members. Um, and such restrictions made those living in the UK reshape the ways in which we engage in culture. And this is our main interest. So the research question we will be discussing today is what changes in cultural engagement took place during the time of the lockdown? And how did individuals feel about these changes. Uh, we conducted an exploratory survey, which is a part of a wider project. Uh, uh, I'll speak about that uh, in a few minutes. We conducted a small exploratory survey in June and July, 2020. Uh, we asked about 100 respondents uh, uh, four questions. We used snowball method, uh, distributed a very short questionnaire through various uh, platforms. Um, this produced um, a small sample, which is non-representative, uh, 
non-probability, uh, not random, but uh, we were more or less satisfied with the distribution of the main sociodemographic characteristics, although there was uh, um, a little bias uh, towards um, higher uh, education. So it's not uh, a very telling uh, sample, but uh, it's certainly indicative of some of the themes that we're facing when thinking about cultural engagement uh, during lockdown. And we've identified three major themes based on the four open questions that we asked in this uh, small survey. The first theme has to do with uh, two opposing trends of, uh, on the one hand, uh, decrease, and on the other hand, an increase in social interactions and in the sense of togetherness that people reported. The other major theme is uh, opportunities versus barriers that this new situation uh, presents in terms of uh, engagement with culture. And uh, the third theme has to do with tensions between spaces, specifically home and work. So I'll speak about the first uh, theme, which is um, a decrease sometimes and in other times an increase in social interaction, interactions as a sense of togetherness. Um, respondents reported uh, significant reduction in their social interactions uh, due to the lockdown. Uh, they said they couldn't go to work or socialize with, with their friends, go to the pub, go to the cinema and so on. Um, the title of our talk is taken from uh, one of the quotes, holidays celebrated alone, languages that go unspoken, always feeling like an outsider in the current country I live in, which was very interesting for us. And this is something we would like to look further into in terms of how um, minorities, immigrants, other specific groups feel in this uh, context. But in contrast to these reports, others felt closer to their families and to people in their immediate environments, such as uh, their neighbors. Uh, the new situation forced people to interact with communities based on local geography, rather than cultural eco chambers across a more the, the dispersed geography. So some people did feel that um, the, the, the new restrictions and the lockdown were a reason for them to socialize uh, more frequently with their neighbors, with people who live closer by, and to develop new opportunities in terms of cultural engagement. The second theme, theme has to do with the contrast between barriers and opportunities. So some respondents highlighted their inabilities to travel or to go to the museum or the theater, engage in cultural practices. Uh, but in contrast, others found new opportunities during the lockdown, uh, especially by consuming culture through uh, digital platforms. For some participants, current circumstances presented an opportunity to be more rather than less creative also. So although we mainly asked about consumption of culture, we also uh, received questions that emphasize the production of culture and being creative and, uh, and developing new hobbies or enhancing existing hobbies uh, in, in the creative um, realms. Um, one respondent observed that an enormous uh, flourishing of uh, cultural practices, especially online. Creativity has gone through the roof as people have had to find other media for their cultural expression. Another one said, I've missed going to the theater and concerts but have enjoyed good drama at home. I'm dancing most days with friends via Zoom and I'm listening to more music with Spotify. It has reduced my social interactions with friends and colleagues. It has encouraged me to plan my social activities and access contents through the internet. A final theme has to do with the tension between spaces where the home becomes a mixed use space in which work and leisure blend with each other. 
For instance, one uh, participant said that uh, the lockdown made him connect to a more holistic sense of culture as something inseparable to work, home, art, and social life, rather than a discrete, discrete set of rules. So to summarize, the themes that emerge from our data point to a division between the Brits. While some feel a lack in social interactions, others find a new sense of togetherness. Some identify opportunities in social restrictions and others emphasize the barriers they encountered when trying to consume culture. Uh, since we conducted this uh, survey um, during the summer, uh, similar findings have uh, been reported in several exploratory studies uh, in the UK. And together, these different reports allow the portrayal of um, our main focus, which is new opportunities for policy to reshape the way we engage with culture and to ensure the viability of this important aspect of our lives. Um, we found some indication uh, qualified by our small sample size that different social groups, for example, based on gender, age, education, experienced the lockdown differently. You can see here a word cloud that was produced using the, the answers to, to one of the questions and the differences between male and female respondents. And for example, we find that more male participants compared with female reported the lockdown as presenting barriers to engaging with culture. So this too is information that we should uh, further explore and substantiate and that can very importantly inform policy. The UK is currently under a second lockdown and evidence points to the importance of accessibility to culture for individuals' well-being. We see from our uh, preliminary investigation that some people independently find creative ways to connect with their families, with their friends, with their communities, and with culture. But there is room for governmental responsibility to ensure that cultural engagement will be accessible to all. The last few months have offered an opportunity to observe what happens to everyday cultural engagement in times of crisis. And from this, we can learn about what culture means to individuals and how to mitigate barriers to engaging with culture in future social crises. Um, this report uh, is part of a larger project that we are engaged uh, in at the moment, uh, which is a project funded by Horizon 2020. Uh, in this uh, research, we aim to contribute to um, identifying the cultural and social preconditions required for the strategic goals of the new EU agenda for culture to be realized we adopt a bottom-up approach that we also uh, presented today uh, in the project to provide insight into multiple and sometimes contradictory, as we showed, concepts of culture and understandings of the societal values of culture among various social groups. Um, you have here details of the project website. Um, the information we presented today is also uh, drawn from a blog post we published in Discover Society at the end of September. The exploratory research that uh, I talked about was also conducted in the eight other countries that are part of this uh, research. And uh, in the near future, we will be able to report um, more elaborately uh, about the, the comparative uh, findings of some of the um, issues that I presented today. And Neta and I, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, very interesting, but um, you also made my, my job as a timekeeper very, very easy. You were actually under time. So thank you very much for that. So we have time maybe for two, maybe three questions. So, who would like to ask a question? Um, 
or perhaps make a comment about the paper. Uh, I, I might, uh, if I could kick, kick off uh, question time, uh, Tally and, and Netta, I um, thought that uh, there were some interesting findings there, but I wanted to maybe draw you out a little bit more on the notion of cultural participation and whether you think uh, the lockdown has shifted what that might mean and the, the rhetorics around cultural participation in the sense that uh, I suppose that one of the, the images of um, that has accompanied the pandemic is not just people listening uh, to um, say music uh, passively uh, through technologies, but you know, getting out on balconies and, and singing or trying to participate uh, also in a virtual or online environment. So uh, do you think that the understanding of cultural particip participation has shifted and that maybe therefore what is consumption and production in, 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 within cultural or creative realms is also evolving during this period? Neta, would you like to take that? Um, yes, I can, I can start and then you can <laughs> follow up. Um, um, thank you um, for inviting us uh, to talk today. I'm really happy to take part in this panel. Um, I think that what is interesting about uh, what we found and also um, the examples that you provided is that that idea of uh, it, practices that you can do on your own and practices that you can do um, uh, together with other people and the idea that um, culture and cultural practices are also very much tied to a sense of belonging and togetherness. Um, so I think that is definitely something that the pandemic has heightened. Um, and of course, the idea of is it something that is just consumed or something that is produced? Um, personally, I think that is also the idea of who has the abilities, the um, the artistic abilities, or even uh, in terms of um, um, just in terms of having the ability to create uh, on your own, but in terms of doing things um, together, yes, there was that idea of going out to the balcony and sharing things. Um, but I think um, as someone who is um, currently in Manchester as well in the UK, and I can definitely see that that has decreased. <laughs> People are no longer going out to their balconies. Um, so maybe there was um, a heightened sense of a need of togetherness and feeling something. Um, as a group, that has definitely decreased in the second uh, lockdown, which is interesting. I'm not sure how to explain it. Maybe people are just <laughs> can't uh, really <laughs> handle it anymore and just too tired and just trying to survive. But that is something that it could be interesting to, to research. Yeah, I could add to that that the question of how people define culture and cultural engagement is very important to us. And we asked very open and broad questions rather than pointing uh, respondents to specific ways in which we think of culture. And indeed, we, we received a wide range of responses. So cultural engagement, cultural participation for our respondents meant um, things having to do with celebrating the holidays, Easter and Christmas, uh -huh. uh, going to the pub. It had to do with sports. It had to do with uh, the more traditional sense of listening to music and, and watching a play, but uh, also more generally with socializing. Uh, so it's a very, very broad concept. And this is also something that was very interesting to see and that we're uh, especially interested in. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it seems that when we ask people about cultural engagement in the context of the lockdown, uh, the conception of, of engaging with culture is very, very broad and very diverse. Okay. Can I just ask a question in there, Eduardo? Please, please. Um, so when you said there were variations in how people reacted, some of them felt that they could get together in, in the neighborhood and sort of, you know, they became more connected with people in the neighborhood. Do you have any sense of the kind of relationship between pre-existing neighborhood relations and <clears throat> how that figured? Because 
there has in the past been quite a lot of work done in the UK about social mobility and the notion of neighbourhoods and how people you know kind of interact with each other or don't react to, with each other depending on how they come to be part of that neighborhood if you, if you see what i mean so i wondered if you would mapped any correlations there in terms of those trends um we're still uh, right now we're um trying to an analyze the data with r which is new to me so mm -hmm. we're trying to look at um different things that can come up from that so and also because um, it was it was um, it was it, it was a survey. There weren't any interviews included, so we couldn't have follow up questions and ask what exactly did they um, encounter before the pandemic and what kind of uh, sense of belonging they had before. Um, but we are currently, as Tali uh, mentioned very briefly, um, we want to expand our understanding of. Um, immigrants um, um, in comparison to um, to people who were born in the UK, maybe that also has something to do with it, with that um, sense of belonging and 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 the need to communicate with your immediate surrounding. Uh, whereas with immigrants, sometimes, first of all, they're already used to talking to people on Zoom um, to their families and friends from back home. Um, so that is definitely something that we want to keep looking into and examine. Okay, thanks. Okay, if there are no other comments, um, our next three, and thank you very much uh, to those uh, uh, two speakers. Um, this is my first uh, Zoom conference, so I'm not quite sure whether we should all clap or whatever, but I'll simply say thank you. And uh, I'm sure that everyone enjoyed it. And we look forward to uh, seeing the publication of, of results. Um, our next uh, three speakers, uh, Andy, Ernesta, and Ben are at uh, Griffith University, a place that's very close to my heart. That's where I did my, my doctorate many years ago. Um, they're going to be speaking on youth, music making, and well being during a public health crisis. So I'll hand it over to Andy et al. Thanks, Eduardo. Can you see the screen? I can, yeah. Thanks, Ernesta. Um, so uh, a quick thanks to the, uh, the organizers of today for uh, inviting us along to do the, the talk, uh, presentation, should I say, uh, and a quick word of thanks to the Griffith Center for Social and Cultural Research for providing some of the funding which, well, the funding which informs this small pilot study, at least the Australian part of it. Um, what we're going to talk about today forms part of an international study, which also includes Professor Paula Guerra from the University of Porto in Portugal and Dr. Francis Howard at Nottingham Trent University in England. I think we can say England now rather than United Kingdom without getting pills of abuse thrown at us. Um, and um, yeah, but we're just going to report today on the, uh, the Australian data. So um, if you could uh, furnish me with the next slide, please, Ernesto. Thank you. So the background and rationale to this, well, obviously uh, the most pressing thing is the fact that COVID is a, an unsurprising and um, in recent times unprecedented public health crisis. Um, it emerged very quickly. It had some very, very sort of instance uh, sort of um, circumstances and, and impacts, lockdowns and social distancing, which as we heard in the previous presentation, have affected all social groups in, in different parts of the world, um, and has resulted in experiences of alienation and meaninglessness, not buzzwords of governments and policymakers, I should add. I think these are the kind of the currently just coming to the surface um, impacts of, of COVID on a grander scale. So this project focuses on young people and uh, we're using 18 to 35 years uh, as the category here because on balance, this is what still counts as young given we've got an elasticated kind of transitions and you know, related sort of themes. So 18 to 35 years seems to cut it in terms of talking about youth and young adulthood. 
uh, and it's music makers broadly defined uh, with a, uh, a purpose of just looking at the value of music as a source of well-being and how people have used it to sort of cope with the tensions and stresses of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please, Anastasia. Okay, thanks, Andy. So just to, very briefly, what, sorry, my cat wants to participate as well. Joys are working at home. Um, what do you mean? What do we mean by well-being? Um, as you would know, well-being is a very nuanced and multifaceted concept which stands for multiple aspects of life and therefore is quite difficult to define. And not surprisingly today, there's no one agreed definition of what well-being means. And there's a lot of definitions that come up in literature, lots of conceptualizations of well-being that you can see in the literature and they obviously vary by discipline as well. But for, our, for the purpose of, this, of our study, we draw on the definition of well-being as proposed by Dodge and his colleagues. Um, where well-being is defined as the balance point between an individual resource pool of psychological, social, physical um, resources and respective challenges faced. So here the figure that you can see on the screen is the visual representation of this definition. It is a dynamic definition. Um, here the CSO represents a balancing of resources and challenges resulting in stable well-being. So in other words, an individual who possesses the psychological, social and physical resources to meet the respective challenges is considered to be in a state of stable well-being. So in the case of increased challenges without any additional resources, the CSO dips along with well-being and vice versa. So there's this movement happening in individual um, is a knowledge to have an active role in shaping their own well-being. So this definition presents a number of strengths, such as simplicity, universal application, as in it can be applied to various individuals, population, regardless of age, culture, um, and sex, as well as optimism, meaning that individuals are able to affect their own well-being to balance that seesaw of resources so they can build resources to address the challenges that they might be facing. It is also a useful definition when considering the role of music as a supportive resource for well-being, which is what we are interested in, in our study. And we also situate the individual within the context, which is a global pandemic, which, as we all know, has created additional challenges for well-being. So in short, we apply this definition of well-being to explore how young people draw on music making as an additional resource to balance the well-being during these unprecedented times. Andy? Thank you. So uh, just a little bit about uh, what we already know uh, about youth music making and well-being in a time of crisis. And predictably, a lot of what we do know isn't directly about um, sort of first world um, issues. It tends to be about music being used as a source of uh, well-being in times of crisis and for things such as war, uh, refugeeism and ecological disasters. Uh, the, the third ecological disasters is also, of course, beginning to sort of manifest uh, in the sort of developed world situations now. Um, and so this focusing on the role of music in youth and resilience to crisis broadly defined also tend to emphasize the value of structured interventions, things like music therapy or psychological support. Um, so in other words, you know, using sort of creative projects, music making, filmmaking or whatever, to sort of help people, help young people get through kinds of moments of personal crisis through a kind of lens of um, structured intervention. And <clears throat> at the moment, this is kind of where the literature tends to land. Um, myself and Paul Palaguerra run a, a conference called Kismet, which some of you might have heard of. And in 2020, we were planning to do something about uh, DIY cultures, youth cultures, and global challenges. And of course, had we had the conference in full, we would have talked about COVID as well. But so far, there is not really very much literature or studies that looks at sort of you know, youth in the first world, developed world, and music as a kind of source of dealing with crisis in, in the ways that we're um, sort of doing it 
through the project, which is to look at kind of do-it-yourself initiatives, self-enablement, and, and those sorts of things. Next slide, please. Okay, so very briefly about the methods. Um, to collect the data, we'll use some structured interviews. Um, we, do, we conducted them online because of the restrictions using Zoom or Skype. Um, anyone who's age 18 to 35 years uh, and consider themselves a music maker of any kind and any level we're eligible to participate. Uh, we recruited participants based on convenience and um, using progressive sampling. So they needed to meet the characteristics that we're after. And we use various strategies to recruit participants such as universities call for volunteers, broadcast email, call outs on social media and by use of gate gatekeepers, relevant organizations that are involved in local music scenes to basically source the participants. Data was analyzed using thematic analysis. And of course, the study was approved by our university's um, ethics committee. So here you can see some of the key participant characteristics. As you can see, we had quite a nice spread in terms of um, gender identification, uh, seven females, 10 males, and one participant who identified as non-binary. The mean age was around 27 years. Most of our participants were Australian, um, as well as resided in state of Queensland. This is where we are located with some participants in other states, New South Wales, Victoria, one participant in each, as well as Australian capital territory. In terms of employ employment, most of our participants were employed part-time or full-time, um, and six of them were um, students and one participant was unemployed. In terms of music making level, again, we have quite a nice spread in terms of um, where they fit. Um, so four participants were professional music makers, six semi-professional, um, seven amateurs, and one of the participants was um, studying to become a professional music maker. Um, various types of music making uh, were evident. So we had some uh, participants who were instrumentalists, um, singers, songwriters, as, as well as um, majority of participants fit into category of multiple. So that means um, singers, songwriters, guitarists, so people who did multiple things in terms of music making. In terms of performance frequency, uh, participants range from not recently to five times per week. Uh, but roughly speaking, all our participants said that they perform at least um, weekly or one time per week. In terms of perceived impacts of COVID-19 on music activity, uh, half of our participants said that it, it increased, which is interesting. Um, uh, six participants felt that it decreased and the rest were neutral or had mi mixed feelings about that. In terms of perceived career impacts, um, six participants stated that they felt that there are positive impacts. Uh, five felt it's negative um, and the last categories were neutral or uncertain where um, seven participants were basically unsure what future brings in terms of their career in music. And in terms of perceived impact of music making um, during and beyond COVID-19 pandemic, our participants unanimously said that music is a strong source of well-being as well as social connectedness. So that leads to our findings. And Ben, it's on to you now. Thanks, Ernesto. So our interviews are continuing, uh, but we have some quite clear preliminary findings and to an extent they seem to resonate with what's being found by our counterparts in, um, in, in Portugal and, and in the United Kingdom as well with some nuances. Uh, so firstly, in terms of how COVID-19 affected musicians, uh, it was much the same as, uh, as the rest of the world. Um, quite significant impacts with a primary one being a loss of income and jobs, um, and that included a loss of music making jobs and income, and also a loss for some people of alternative work that they do. Um, and along with a loss of social connections and general disruption of routines and plans, this created significant mental health impacts, which for many of our participants, if not their first, it was quite a significant experience of mental health challenges. Um, tipping that, that seesaw we were talking about. So an example uh, of how these things mix is shown here by Emma, a professional singer, who uh, said she had the rest of this year booked up uh, in terms of performances and that was her income. 
uh, at least weekly, she'd be performing. And in March, there were a couple of days where that suddenly changed. She said, I went from being a very booked and blessed artist to absolutely nothing in 24 to 48 hours. So that takes a huge toll on your mental health because you go, holy shit, not only do I identify as an artist and I love singing and performing, there's that added financial stress as well. So there you see for a professional musician, uh, the music making as identity and passion and music making as work and income are really entwined. And that was really hit by the COVID situation. Uh, on the next slide, looking at how COVID affected music making itself, um, the biggest impact was the loss of live performance completely for a, for a significant period of time of months. And it's just coming back by inches now, and that'll be a long process. Um, so music making turned for most people from a social and public activity, for many of them, the core of their weekly social life to a domestic and private activity. Um, and much like in the last paper, there was a real uh, mixture of effects. Um, some people found they had less time for music uh, because either they had to go and get another job or because they had family or caring responsibilities. Some people had more time for music. And, and as Anesta said, that was a good number. That was half. Um, however, even among those who had more time, some of them really made the most of that and did their so-called lockdown projects and were very productive. But some of them uh, thought they would do that and they didn't manage to. There was a psychological barrier of motivation uh, and a large part of it was not having something to work towards, not having a gig coming up. Um, and so Kelly is someone here, a singer songwriter who said, exercise and music making, they're the two things that I really know works for my mental health but they're the ones that you really need to be in the right state of mind to do. And she said, I've tried to turn to songwriting during this time. It hasn't been as successful. When I have been able to get in the mind space to write music, uh, it's been really rewarding. So there's this acknowledgement that music making is something that works for well-being, but you can't turn it on and off like a switch. There's, um, there's to an extent a sort of a, an uncontrollable or, or, or non-rational aspect to it. And so that comes through in, in the next theme, which is exploring just what does music making as such offer as a source of well-being. And uh, a number of themes emerged from this, one being identity. Uh, music making isn't just what I do, it's who I am. And it's how I remember who I am. Even if you are someone who does it as a hobby, perhaps especially, um, it's a sense of purpose. For some people, a sense of service. There was this uh, echoing by some people of the idea that musicians and artists are needed more than ever during COVID. And I wish the government would recognise that. There was that rhetoric. Uh, it's a social connection, which obviously had to find other paths during this time. Uh, music making is something to focus on and a routine. So for some people, there was the very important idea of okay, to get through each day, I've got to eat, I've got to sleep, and I've got to pick up my guitar at least once. That was their well-being strategy. Um, and music making in particular seemed to offer a way of working with feelings and a, a way of communicating and expressing oneself. So we'll just explore those concepts a little in the next slides with a couple of quotes. So Aria... Um, says, and this is exemplary of a lot of musicians I've spoken to, says, when I was younger, I wasn't very good at expressing myself. Music making was a way for me to express. Um, as I've gotten older, that's still the case, but it's also a way for me to see what's going on in my own head. Um, unconscious things slip out. It's a way to monitor my inner environment. Um, so here again, there's this awareness of music making, not just as a performance, an external expression, but a an inner sort of monitoring of one's own well-being. Um, and that echoes in, um, in the next couple of quotes too, where people talked about music making as a way of working with feelings, releasing feelings, recognizing feelings, working through them. And so there was this kind of balance generally between people talking about wanting to write or perform or play hopeful and positive music and those who wanted to really dive into the negative side of things and, and express and experience that. 
So Daniel's an example. He's a classical pianist who suffered a very serious depression when everything was shut down um, and he was bedridden for a while. And as he emerged from that, he sat at his piano and the songs he would play, some of them he chose because they were hopeful or positive or reminded him of happy times. Some were very silent and very mournful in his words so he could get his feelings out. And he speaks about the very physical experience of like a hug or a chill or a warmth from this. And uh, Emma's another example. She says, there were days I would sit down and play and I would cry on the first line, but this is a good thing. This is cathartic. It's getting your emotions out. So again, this sort of reflexive awareness of even by yourself in a private setting, music making is a way of working with your, your feelings. It, it's almost like a sort of mindfulness. So this is quite a, a res we can see this as a resource, I think. Um, so in terms of practical strategies, how did people carry on with their music making? The online environment was very important. Many people have heard about the, the live streaming events. A lot of celebrity artists did that. And that came right down to the, to the more local and independent level as well. A number of our participants, probably most of them participated in those. However, um, almost invariably, they were quick to express their reservations about how it's just not the same as real live performance. Um, it was something to work towards. It gave them a motivation, but it's, it didn't have the same financial rewards or social and emotional rewards. And some of them made the decision personally or as a band, yeah, we're not going to bother with that. Some of them have persisted. But uh, as the next slide notes, um, there was this, the online environment was very important to the community of music makers generally and the young music makers that we spoke to. Um, they used various forms of social media, um, Facebook groups and Instagram um, sessions were um, among these to speak with other musicians, to share their experiences, share their strategies uh, and plans and to share their music. Again, giving them an outlet um, that they needed in order to have the motivation to actually work on music. And Kelly um, here is expressing a common sentiment that during COVID, artists became more willing to connect with each other. There was a sense of a leveled playing field and everyone became open to collaborating and working with you, no matter how successful you were. And, and I did hear this from a number of people at different levels. Uh, ben, were... ben, sorry to interrupt, but you, yeah. you have used 20 minutes. So if, oh. if you could just wrap up in the next minute or, or so. Yeah, sure, be, thank you. That um, would be amazing, sorry. Yeah, you're right. In terms of perspective, I won't delve into that, but you know, uncertainty is the overriding thing, loss of control, but also a renewed recognition of Here's what music means to me. Even though I've had to go and get a normal job, I'll keep making music. And what we've just talked about, I think that helps us to understand why someone would do that. I might hand over to Andy for a, a final wrap up if I can. Yeah, just a very, very quick thing here. I mean, what we've basically just done here is delved really into the life worlds of these young people just to show how you know they're using music to sort of self enable and, and, and sort of improve the quality of life. You know, in a very kind of do-it-yourself fashion very often. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing that we, we've found is that, you know, these young people really, they want to be heard, you know, just to tell, have an opportunity to tell their own story, what music has meant to them during crisis. And so final slide, please, Ernesto. Um, so we think this is just a, an interesting snapshot of how things are and how things may well progress in the future. I mean, we're not out of the COVID woods yet and may not be for a long time. So there's really, this is a, an interesting reflection on how the post-digital, post-risk generation who are already feeling vulnerable about things in the world, how they're drawing on these kind of, you know, stocks of creative, uh, sort of knowledge and capacity really to find coping strategies during COVID. I'll end it there. Thanks for that. Okay, thank you. Time for a very quick comment or question. Does anyone have uh, a comment or question that they would like to address to our three speakers? Can I? May I? Please. 
thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Um, there's been this uh, neoliberal um, expectation that uh, people uh, like musicians reinvent themselves during this uh, um, pandemic uh, period and adapt and make the most of it. And, you know, um, maybe this is uh, an expectation that uh, is, is directed in particular to young people. I was wondering, I think you alluded to some of, of it, but I was wondering whether this was a theme that came up um, and it's of course very problematic because if you are unable to reinvent yourself, um, then uh, you are to blame and something is wrong with you and why aren't you, you know, um, being adaptable and that puts the pressure back on, uh, on you and, and you feel guilty. So I was wondering whether your uh, participants um, discussed any of these uh, sentiments at all. Ben, do you want to speak to that? Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tally. I think um, there was this, some people spoke in terms of, oh, I know I should be using this time to work on my online presence, or I know I should be doing this form of engagement uh, to build my audience or build my profile. So there does seem to be an awareness of um, that there's an onus on them. And some said, and I've done that and it's great. And some said, but I just can't, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. So there, there does seem to be an awareness of this onus being on them. I guess the, the only thing I'd say that sort of perhaps pushes against some of that neoliberal rhetoric is the, the idea of people very much more than ever saying, I'm doing this for myself and, and I'm realizing what I get out of it and my priorities are realigning. Um, there, was, there was definitely some of that going on as well. Mm. Thanks. If I can abuse my position as the, uh, the chair just a little bit. Um, uh, I wanted to know whether amongst musicians there, there might be a kind of, um, call it uh, industry consciousness about uh, things like lockdowns and so forth and the impact it's having. And I, I just a, a very brief anecdote. I, I was invited to Barefoot Lawn Bowls a couple of Fridays ago, and I didn't realize this, but everyone else who, who went to this event uh, was uh, working in the tourism industry. And I have to say that uh, although the attitudes uh, in relationship to COVID and uh, lockdowns was not exactly Trumpish, it was possibly to the right of the political spectrum uh, where they felt that various politicians were perhaps uh, overstating the significance of public health um, as against uh, Ec ec economics uh, now might have been that you know I, I I was there with the wrong tourism people, but I, I I did get the feeling that you know they they were feeling it, and a lot of them owned businesses. They were feeling the effects of the pandemic very directly. So I'm just wondering, do young musicians have similar kinds of attitudes to the economic impacts that this is having? Well, if I can just kick off and then my colleagues might want to say something as well. I mean, <clears throat> obviously one of the big things that has happened in the last 10 years, maybe a bit longer, is that live music <clears throat> has really become the bread and butter of many music makers because of the difficulty of making money back from recording music. So I think <clears throat> this is actually one of the two papers that we're currently writing on from the project. Um, talking about how the COVID situation has kind of undercut that sort of, um, you know, new era of music making just as it was getting going, you know, the, oh. the ability to play a festival or, you know, to sort of play like a street gig or, you know, or whatever, or, you know, or a club gig or something. So I think that's where a lot of young musicians will definitely be feeling the pain. Um, whether or not it's a neoliberal thing, I don't know. I mean, you know, musicians need to make money from what they do. And as anyone who's made music, even not for a living knows, it's hard work to do. So, you know, there is, there's a bit of kind of give and take in that one, I think. Um, ben or Ernesto, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, I, I can say that we did decide to start asking and we asked most people, um, 
their views on are you concerned about returning? What are your thoughts on the pace of returning to live performance? And we did find them to be overwhelmingly patient and, mm. um, you know, not wanting to rush things. And so that was quite interesting given the impacts. It might align with a sort of a, you know, the, the political identity that might tend to dominate amongst the young musicians. I'm not sure. No, no, very interesting. All right, well, look, uh, thank you very much uh, to the three of you. Uh, it's fantastic research and um, it speaks to the, the themes of the panel very, very well. So, so, so thank you. Um, our next uh, two speakers have woken up very, very early to join us. I believe that it's just a little bit after six there um, in the north of the, of the UK. Um, Mohamed Chedid and Alexandros Skandalis are both in the business school at Lancaster University in management and marketing, I believe. Um, and the topic that they're going to be addressing is a digital textual sociological exploration of alternative modes of touch and contact lessons from queer digital spaces. So I'll hand it to you, Mo and Alex. Thanks, Eduardo. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, right. So, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really glad to be part of uh, this panel session. And I'd like to thank you, Eduardo, for inviting us. Uh, so, um, uh, both uh, Mo and myself, uh, we're based at Lancaster. Uh, this, this project uh, was inspired by uh, the blog article that we wrote for the Sociological Reviews Digital Theme on Texture. And in fact, what we wanted to do here was to uh, <clears throat> reflect upon the variety of ways through which our uh, interactions with uh, surfaces, with objects, with uh, other people as well, have been changing uh, during COVID-19, uh, especially since touch and contact have become heavily uh, policed over the last uh, six months or so. So uh, uh, this is uh, a conceptual uh, project at the moment. And with this presentation, our, our aim is to discuss the uh, transformation of socialization processes due to the digitalization of uh, entertainment, of community formation during the pandemic. And we have actually decided to focus on queer uh, digital entertainment spaces uh, because we think that they kind of like constitute uh, a really interesting research context um, because the policing of touch and contact is not new for queer communities or queer people and this have been historically uh, um, policed in a variety of ways. So uh, our aim then was to kind of like to uh, question how the world is safe how the world is sensed uh, in a, during the pandemic in the post COVID-19 society as well. Um, and as we will discuss, we kind of like um, um, uh, put forth this kind of like this uh, idea of the digital picture of sociological understanding of experiences of queer resilience, of queer creativity um, in mobilizing digital technologies to, uh, to create uh, digital spaces, uh, especially when it comes to entertainment, that engage artists, creatives, organizers, promoters, and, and audiences. So, um, uh, just to want to start with a bit of context. So, as we know, over the last months, uh, uh, since the outbreak of coronavirus, uh, social interactions, our practices have been entirely transformed, and we seem to have entered into. Uh, uh, a distinct mode of everyday life, if you like, which um, revolves around social distancing, around safe social encounters, around fear as well, and an over-reliance, I would say, to digital technologies to get us through the day. So, of course, uh, uh, this, this new social reality has been fueled not only by the ongoing pandemic, but also by governmental regulation, by guidelines, by rules, uh, we've just included some, uh, some pictures here, police in India uh, trying to enforce lockdown with, uh, with patterns. Uh, police officers make people leave parks uh, and public spaces in North London, or uh, gay men and transgender women uh, that were arrested in Ungada 
uh, last March will define rules when it comes to uh, social distancing. So partly because of the nature of COVID-19 as well, uh, parts and content have actually been subject to processes of uh, uh, prohibition enforced by uh, governmental structures. And also parts and content have been uh, to a certain extent scrutinized by uh, individuals as well, based on their own um, sense-making of uh, biomedical rationalities, for instance, uh, around epidemic withdrawal. So this has uh, led to a situation where um, many people have actually started to perceive uh, the world that they live outside of their homes, uh, outside of their personal spaces, as unsafe, as uh, impure, um, which also led them to be more afraid um, or more skeptical when it comes to, uh, to paths, when it comes to contact with others. So uh, we have started to, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, sanitize our digital devices um, in order to, uh, to access uh, uh, this virtual uh, outside world, outside of our personal spaces as a means to, uh, to cope um, and to kind of like uh, reframe thoughts and contact uh, through digital technologies. So um, if we go at the context of uh, entertainment and uh, the context of uh, uh, digital queer spaces, for instance, uh, of course, we've been witnessing a rise in digital entertainment spaces. Um, uh, often uh, positioned as alternatives to their offline equivalents. Um, uh, again, uh, not necessarily within the context of queer entertainment, but if we think of uh, streaming services, of uh, live virtual music events, uh, binge watching. Um, in the case of uh, uh, queer entertainment, digital pride events, uh, queer digital parties, have been organized uh, across the world during the pandemic. In the UK, for instance, uh, due to COVID restrictions, Pride in its usual format with live outdoor events, with uh, uh, people marching across the streets, with uh, um, street, street parties, um, that was not a possibility. So instead, uh, digital Pride festivals uh, were organized, such as uh, the Brighton Hall Pride Party uh, Festival. Um, which has actually reached its biggest audience ever, uh, which, which is quite interesting. Um, and the same goes for other domains, for example, in the context of the live music industry, we witness the rise of uh, virtual, often uh, positioned as risk-free concerts, uh, often taking place within marginal state settings, with uh, uh, within games, within uh, virtual worlds and social media platforms like Twitch, for instance, with artists inviting audiences to engage with them uh, through the use of uh, technologies such as virtual reality. Uh, but can we really say that these, uh, these digitally driven initiatives are some sort of authentic way to experience entertainment? Or in other words, to kind of like um, link it back to our context is uh, a significant part of the socialization process lost in translation or uh, entirely lost due to, uh, due to the digitalization in the context of queer entertainment uh, and beyond. So um, to kind of like reflect on such questions, we thought that the, the, that the concept of texture uh, becomes important um, as something that uh, captures uh, not only spatial and temporal, but also material and symbolic dimensions of how, how the world is shaped and sensed. So again, in the context of queer entertainment, uh, if we look at prior research, uh, there's a historical relationship between queer communities and digital technologies for the creation of uh, um, embodied socialities in environments that uh, uh, are more safe in a way. So in the past, uh, digital spaces have been uh, communicated as, 
uh, and how, how actually being as a protective uh, environment for queer people, uh, especially if we think that uh, queerness has actually been occupying a liminal uh, physical space uh, within society. So the digital has always been an important platform for connecting with others, for community formation and establishing a sense of identity and belonging as well. So if we look at this quote here from a digital uh, uh, party uh, as part of the 2020 edition of Digital Pride, saying that uh, digital space is not a now known uh, territory. Uh, this were the spaces actually where many of us took the first steps in exploring our identities. And in the recent years as well, with the rise of uh, social media location apps like uh, Grindr or Tinter, there has also been some sort of uh, reconfiguration of, uh, of uh, embodiment in digital spaces when it comes to, uh, uh, to queer entertainment. Since they <clears throat> kind of like actively foreground uh, embodiment and physical encounter, and they also adopt a hybrid uh, approach, which also focuses on, on material spaces and uh, on, on the kind of like physical interaction that people have with, uh, with each other. So uh, with the ongoing pandemic, um, we kind of like, uh, if, if we think of, uh, of, of, of hybridized experiences, if we think of, uh, of, of, of this mixture of physical and digital experiences, um, uh, these kind of like become even more important if we want to theorize uh, digital futures, especially when alternative modes of cuts and content are being, uh, are being involved. So, um, um, for instance, um, it's not surprising to kind of like see that uh, uh, in the past, queer communities have been pioneers in utilizing digital technologies to connect with each other. And uh, if we look at the launch of uh, geolocation dating apps like Scrap or uh, Grindr uh, for gay men, uh, these have completely transformed uh, the world's dating scene into uh, some sort of like gamified uh, erotic terrain. Uh, where there's a mixture of both physical and virtual experiences. So with, with this kind of like hybrid experiences in mind and uh, the new social reality that, is, uh, that we've been experiencing during the pandemic, uh, kind of like becomes more important to critically interrogate uh, how technology mediates in a way real life social uh, interactions in embodied space and what this means uh, in our context for queer technology, for identity, for, uh, for belonging as well. Um, but also uh, quite important to kind of like take into consideration that some of these uh, digital entertainment spaces have also been a, a, a fertile uh, terrain for the reproduction of a number of uh, inequalities of systems of oppression as well, such as racism, xenophobia. Uh, so uh, going back to the example of Grindr, uh, apps like Grindr are often uh, contested cultural spaces in a sense. Uh, we've got this kind of like uh, negotiation between the public and the private, but there are also tensions for self-presentation grounded within uh, contemporary sexual politics. And uh, we've got this example here, uh, it's just a recent one uh, with uh, what happened with Grindr, uh, which it was only after uh, the global protests and the murder of uh, George Floyd that Grindr actually uh, finally removed their ethnicity filter from the app. The move that was, however, considered to be uh, to a certain extent insufficient to tackle uh, the existing uh, racism and xenophobia on the dating app. So um, we wanted to bring into the picture this um, concept of intersectionality as well. And this idea of um, an intersectional approach uh, to make sure that uh, when we're thinking about reframing cuts and content, um, uh, 
in digital queer spaces uh, in order to, to kind of make it more safe, more inclusive. Uh, intersectionality uh, also uh, becomes quite important. And I'm, I'm going to hand it over to, um, to Mo now, um, who's going to talk a bit further about um, uh, kind of like uh, the theoretical foundations behind uh, some of the stuff that we've been working on in this project, drawing on the work of uh, Barat and, and some other um, uh, secondary uh, research data that we've managed to gather. Cheers, Alex. Thanks a lot. Um, so I, I'll just speak really quickly around all the boring theories called substantive data, but just briefly how we were thinking about it. So the dating apps obviously are provi were providing this hybrid mode where people would try to connect online and then meet in the physical space. However, what happens when that act of meeting and touching each other become uh, problematic either from a legal or moral uh, point of view? Uh, so they were like, as in different spaces and different uh, cases that we saw this morning and uh, music and all that, uh, there was a, a resurgence of like more and more digital spaces, more and more digital encounters. And with that, there was the need for a careful crafting of the digital space uh, and both the material and symbolic dimensions of those spaces. Uh, and with that, there was the, the, uh, the need to carefully consider the tensions between uh, soft and hard textural qualities. So by soft, we refer to aesthetic qualities, and especially in digital spaces, because there's not this sense of touching and feeling the temperature or the vibrations of other bodies. Uh, so there's a need to focus on uh, uh, the, the, the size, how we see things, so the colors, the shapes, the movement complexity, uh, the depth. So all of these elements became more important, but also the hearing. So the uh, the pitch, the heart, all these, the visual and auditory stimuli became more important. But then at the same time, there was the need to consider the hard uh, textual qualities, which are more, come from more technological and economic uh, rationale. Uh, so for instance, here we are meeting at this conference through Zoom, uh, and Zoom was like a popular mode as well, but there were a lot of considerations. So there were some, um, uh, queer digital spaces where, like, for instance, we're going to see the example of Queer House Party, and they had the first come, first serve basis. They tried to make it free and accessible to everyone. Uh, however, uh, because of the limitation of the platform, they needed to limit the entry. Um, and for instance, now it says your internet connection is unstable. So obviously, all <laughs> uh, it says on my screen now, so I was like, oh, scary. But th that was something to consider. So basically, uh, how. Um, uh, to make the platform inclusive, also technologically uh, sound. At the same time, there were other spaces which were reserved. For instance, uh, Rainbow Noir was uh, uh, in Manchester, was organizing events for queer people of color, and people basically need to uh, send uh, either a message or an email beforehand and it's confirming their identity in order to access those spaces. Uh, so these are these were also other elements to reconcile between the soft and hard uh textural qualities in in this idea of freer orienting intimacy uh, uh where humans interact with their interaction is mediated through screens um, next slide please right so here we're going to just see briefly two quick examples so the first example is the one of global pride 2020 uh, and obviously, during, due to the pandemic, Pride had to move uh, online for a lot of cities. And this year, there was this. So there were there were some regional uh, Pride. There was also Global Pride, which was organized on the 27th of June. And there were some really really interesting elements in there. So first, the, uh, the slogan was around "Exist, Persist, and Resist." And so there was overall this resurgence to Pride becoming again a protest. Uh, you can see on the right hand side of the, the, the Arabic uh, advert for uh, global pride. It was really interesting. So there was this interview on the BBC with this uh, young queer Lebanese um, kid, and he mentioned that COVID-19 meant for him that he could join pride and not get arrested. And what was interesting there uh, is that because due to the global nature of the event, it was not possible anymore to ignore the geographical location 
uh, where same-sex activity was still criminalized and the conditions of oppression where uh, certain queer people still live. Because Pride has moved more and more to a corporatized form and more and more to celebration and a party and kind of like shifted away from its initial roots as a movement of protest movement and movement of resistance. But the fact that it went global, it wasn't possible anymore to ignore that there were still cases where uh, it was criminalized. If you see, I don't think you can see my point. I'm a, Mo, sorry to interrupt, but uh, you guys have used up 20 minutes now. Ooh. All right. Okay, I'm gonna. If you can wind it up. The next slide. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna move really quickly. Uh, just two examples. So here, the second example of textures that we wanted to show is how the pride uh, flag uh, was basically there was a, a reclaiming of textures of resistance of the rainbow flag and also adding to it uh, the trans flag and also adding to it the black and brown colors to highlight uh, the other queer. Uh, uh, identities. If you can move to the next slide really quickly, uh, Alex. Next slide, please. Yeah, cheers. Uh, just another example of textures that we wanted to look at is the, the art of drag and how it was very um, strong uh, and present in queer digital spaces during the pandemic. It was present before, but especially during the pandemic. And we can see that there are the use of makeup and texture to, to defy uh, gender uh, norms norms uh so if you can maybe because to wrap up you can move to the final slide alex please just the next one just the final one uh right so basically our main argument is around uh this need of creativity resilience and courage to queer um touch and contact the queer interactions and move to uh move them to a digital uh space and we're gonna finish more with a question uh, than anything. Uh, so to paraphrase La Fuente, we ask, how can we ensure that the digital media we attempt to grasp through our thinking and writing is not textureless and hence lifeless in a post-COVID world? And how can we create alternative forms of interacting uh, in digital uh, spaces? Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, perhaps a, a short question or comment and a short answer. All right, perhaps uh, we, we, at the end of this, this time, there, there might be a question or people may uh, email you directly to, um, with their questions. All right, moving to the next presentation, it's by uh, Marianne Clark at the University of New South Wales. And the title is, How Movement Comes to Matter, Exploring the Sensory Atmospheres and Embodied Affects of Physical Activity During COVID-19. Okay, does that look good to everybody? And can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be involved in this really um, exciting panel. It's my first TASA conference and TASA panel, so I was thrilled to receive the invitation. And I'm going to be talking today uh, about a project that I'm undertaking right now at the Vitalities Lab at UNSW. And my interest, um, I have a physical, cultural, and actually physical education and activity background. And so my interest has always been in the body and the moving body um, as a material, social, political, and cultural entity, and particular as a, particularly as an active force. So not only something that expresses um, our cognitions, but that is always um, implicated in the generation of meaning and experience. And I've been inspired by Foucauldian perspectives. Um, my PhD, I called myself a reluctant Foucauldian during my dissertation. I did my dissertation on uh, girls' experiences of ballet and the body. And I um, found that I was looking for more than what Foucault offered me at that time and shifted my focus to some vitalist and new materialist perspectives so that I could get a little bit more at the um, corporality of, of embodiment. And now I am um, deeply immersed in some of the new materialist perspectives, but increasing mindfulness of the debt this work pays to other ways of knowing. And when COVID hit, I was really curious, um, just anecdotally, observing in my neighborhood, I live in the eastern suburbs in Sydney, I'm a Canadian transplant, so I had been living in Sydney for only 
mm, maybe six months when this all hit and noticed people engaging in outdoor spaces very differently um, and seeing more people on the sidewalks and noticing my own body feeling really still and stuck at home on the couch. And I became really interested in what was at stake for the body in the pandemic. Um, of course, it, of course, we, the virus, we live the pandemic in and through our body. Um, but there's a lot of other aspects of the body and the moving body that weren't necessarily being captured, but that I could sort of sense in my, in my social environments around me. Um, and physical activity and exercise uh, framed in that way was often positioned as something that we should do to engage in or to protect our, our health and well being. Um, so there is a lot of official advice reminding us to be active, to maintain activity levels for our well being and mental and physical health. Um, but we know that even before the pandemic hit, that physical activity is a very complex behavior that is contingent upon a lot of social, interpersonal, economic factors, um, you know, how, how much access people have to pleasant spaces to, to move in. Um, and so I was quite, I've always been quite interested in how we might elaborate some of the dominant framings of physical activity and bodily movement that exceed these very sort of narrow health, health framings. So I devised a research study and Deborah Lupton is collaborating with me on this, but I was basically just interested in how Australians are um, creating new physical activity and movement practices during COVID-19 and what those movement practices meant to them. So specifically how people are engaging in space and place, um, I think is interesting being a transplant and living by the ocean for the first time in my life. Um, really enjoying living by the ocean um, and also observing how people interacted with that, but also acknowledging it as a privilege. Um, and seeing people repurpose spaces, so seeing people repurpose their garages, um, their backyards and gardens if they were fortunate to have them. So it's very interesting in how people were engaging and repurposing space and what roles um, that human and more than human agents had. So what roles were digital technologies had? The digital fitness industry responded with, um, with, a, with a zeal. You know, there's all sorts of free online classes offered um, and it was really, really positive for those people who, who are oriented towards that. But I was also interested in what ways digital technologies might come more to the fore or to the background of people's movement experiences, especially as the pandemic unrolled and we spent more times in front of our screens. And then finally, what meaning do these movement practices hold? The pandemic is a stressful time for many people. So what role did um, movement play in people's adaptations and experiences of the pandemic? So I want, I'm not going to go into this in, in detail um, just for the sake of time, but I am interested in, I'm very interested in relational ontologies so that our experience is always, and meaning is always emerging through relations with our encounters with our social and material worlds. Um, and so Deleuzean concepts of assemblage, affects and desire are guiding my thinking, um, but I acknowledge that Deleuze is sometimes hard to get a, a concrete grasp on. And so I'm taking up other people who are, who are working with Deleuze as well. Um, Eve Tuck has a really great paper that I'm engaging with right now on desire. And she breaks up with Deleuze because she's not quite satisfied with his, his idea of desire. But I am, these are the concepts that I'm, that I'm working with. Um, and the concept of desire comes out in my work in the concept of longing, which I'll talk about a little bit more. For my methods, I, um, of course, I engaged in digital methods. So I conducted virtual interviews and asked people to give me a tour of whatever workout space they were using, whether that be, you know, not everyone was engaging in full on exercise and fitness. And that was my intent. Sometimes people were just walking around their neighborhoods and I asked them to either take photos or if we could participate in an interview while they were walking. Um, give me tours of their indoor space, of their lounge or of their garage if they had repurposed that into a gym. And I also asked people to engage in a digital photo diary. And those have been really rich in eliciting uh, really interesting insights into people's experiences. So basically people were asked to upload a photo one day, um, every day for about five days and write a small story about what that photo meant to them. And that photo was to be related somehow to their physical activity practice, but that was quite open for interpretation. 
Um, and so it could be a view from their, from their walk, or it could be um, something that they saw while they were, while they were running, or it could be quite literal, and it could be the dumbbells that they had made out of their, you know, water jugs and sand. My, my data collection is still ongoing and I've, part, I've collected data from 20 people so far, um, 12 women and eight men. I'm looking for more people. So if anyone knows anyone who might like to participate. Um, and the criteria was that I'm asking people to be active for two times, at least two times a week. And I'm defining activity really loosely. And that is basically any kind of movement that is more than simply going to walking to the store because one has to. It could be a walk, a purposeful walk, but not necessarily a walk to commute or to do household activities or tasks. And I've just listed the spread of people that I have there. So I said, I'm interested in um, getting more men, um, but I have quite a nice spread of ages and people so far. So my analysis was guided by my theoretical concepts and I, it was quite an iterative process, um, but I basically just tried to really attend to the things that I was interested in. So the sensory and kinesthetic dimensions of movement, um, the ideas of space and place and what, what these practices, what emerged through these practices for these individuals. And I'll just talk a little bit now about how I found participants were moved to move, how they engaged in creative improvisations to assemble new movement practices. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, something that's interesting me that's coming out is this, what, I've, what I'm terming, terming assemblages of longing. So participants talked about being moved to move um, during, during, during lockdown. And for some, it was right away. Some people, for some people, uh, regular attendance at the gym was a big part of their life and they got quite uh, quite stressed thinking that the gym wasn't going to be there for them because physical activity can be for some people uh, a release and expression but for some people it's a sense of control as well and um, a lot of people talked about making plans um, you know getting their stash of equipment ready because they saw the lockdown coming others talked about being uh, it talked about it being several weeks before they actually decided they were going to start something. And this move, being moved to move involved sensory and embodied cues. So for some people, so Diana says, I'm so tired of sitting, my legs ached, my whole body ached, I had to do something. And James said similarly, I just started to feel bad in my body. And Lainey echoes this idea of heaviness. And a few people talked about their, their actual bodies aching and wanting to move. And this was, this was um, echoed by people who are avid gym goers and also by people who were sort of more casual exercisers and actually came to, to a new relationship with activity. For other people, it was more external cues and knowledges that prompted this idea or, or prompted them to take action and to create new practices. Um, and there is a couple of participants for whom they lived with mental health issues and it was something that they, they knew that they had to do to take care of themselves and their health practitioners and health professionals that were in their lives were also encouraging them to do so. Other people, it was a family member who said, oh, you know what, maybe it's not great to be doom scrolling through your, through your social media account all day. Why don't you get up and go for a walk or try these online programs? And for a lot of people, and actually just you know, it's a very, very small sample of men. So I'm general, I'm making a, an observation here, but men were more likely to talk about their partners as being really important factors in getting them to move. And when people decided that where they were going to move, they engaged in what I'm calling improvisations of movement. So they could no longer go to the spaces and places that they were familiar with and that were often associated with movement. So they created new practices inside and outside of their homes. And these practices were assembled through their own histories of movement and fitness uh, and their own movement preferences, but also expertise and knowledges that they procured through engagement a lot of times with online fitness apps and, um, and the, online, the online fitness world was, as I said, kind of going gangbusters at this time. Many of them had acquired new fitness equipment. There's lots of funny stories about people trying desperately to buy a uh, skipping rope and people buying things that they just bought because it was the only thing available on the fitness, on the, on the website, and they thought they might use it. 
And as I've mentioned, they reconfigured indoor and outdoor spaces. So I have examples of backyards, rooftop and rooftops and garages, all repurposed. Um, and these were very highly valued by the people who had access to these spaces, uh, not only as a space to go move, but as a space, as a chance to get outside, to get out of their home in which they were working, living, maybe homeschooling their children, caring for other people, um, and generally just absorbing the, the pandemic atmosphere. And also walking trails, parks, and the beach emerge as extremely important spaces. Um, in their stories, the textures of these spaces, um, the, the importance of, of having access to natural, the natural environment was really, really important. And people expressed feeling grateful for this and um, paying sort of a renewed attention to how important it was. So these are just some images of uh, what people might have done outside. So one person has a you know quite a lot of heavy equipment and he was an experienced olympic weightlifter and then this other image is a very very familiar image that i saw a lot of but the yoga mat rolled out um, in front of the tv and funny stories was that a lot of people said especially if they lived alone or just with their partner that sometimes the yoga mat got rolled out and all the you know paraphernalia came out and it never really got put away it just became part of their newly revised pandemic home um, where some people said they tried really hard to, to make the home and the gym workout area separate. I mentioned the outdoor spaces and interestingly, the outdoor spaces had a different sensibility to the indoor spaces. The movements were, were often different. These were often running, cycling, walking type of movements. So not as often engaging in technology in a way that they were following along to another person's, um, following another person's body or following these images. A lot of people did talk about tracking their steps and music. And so I, I've been really interested in some of the other presentations and talk about music. Um, music emerged is very important for a few of my participants. And um, sometimes people would listen to music outside, but mostly people talked about paying attention to the specific details of their natural environments a little bit more and really appreciating the change, what I'm calling the sort of the texture of the atmosphere um, of their own pandemic atmosphere inside their home because people spent so much time inside their home, um, you know, completing so many of the daily tasks. People also improvised new physical activity routines. And I've just provided a couple of examples here. And um, I should mention that, and this is a good example, that it wasn't always natural spaces or pleasant aesthetic outdoor space. It was, it was also city environments as well. So for people who in Sydney did not have a five kilometer radius restriction, they could walk around, they could go anywhere. Um, and Diana was really interesting. She was a woman who was, did not consider herself physically active. And once the pandemic hit, she had just lost her job. So she decided that she was going to have a daily goal of 15,000 steps. And every day she walked 15,000 steps. She created a rough, she actually just kind of made up her walking route as she went. So that was part of her improvisation. Um, and she says sometimes she really likes to go into the city and she loved museums and she loved being, she loved soaking up the energy of the city and seeing other people. Um, as an antidote to a sense of loneliness that she was feeling, or she would walk towards the ocean for motivation and comfort. And another improvisation was a woman who already had a nice home gym setup. She was a fitness instructor, but all of a sudden her home setup was her work setup. So she was teaching classes over Zoom. She had to set up her laptop in her garage. Um, she and her family actually recreated the space so that all family members could use it during this time. So I'll talk now about my assemblages or what I'm calling these assemblages of longing. And I noticed that this sense of longing was emerging in relationship to a lot of, um, in a lot of stories about movement. And I'm, I'm making the, the connection here between longing and Deleuze's desire in that it is social and is sensory and is also lived and it emerges through encounters with others. And participants described longings to see other family members, friends, and for general connections to others, to move their bodies, to have access to pleasant spaces. Some people expressed longing for the gym. They loved, they loved their gym, and not only because it was um, 
it was a social place for them. It was a, it's a way for them to separate their work life and their home life and their and their fitness life. Um, but there is a lot of just a, a sense of a longing for things to resume to normal. And in that there is all these other affects of nostalgia, um, grief, loss. These were all themes that came up and a longing to escape or forget about the current conditions. And this last one is quite important because it was through movement and through this assembling of movement and spaces that some people were able to sort of create this sense of escape. So now these are photos from my um, digital diary. I might just get a check on the time if that's okay. You've used up 17 minutes. Okay, okay. So I will, um, yes, this is, I'll, I'll let you read that. Um, but the photo diaries were really, really cool. People shared some really, um, really great things with me. But this person in our interview talked a lot about the ocean um, and, and the importance of being in the ocean in order to make sense of and cope with the pandemic. He was, he considered himself uh, addicted to exercise. So the pandemic was quite challenging for him in several ways. Um, I'm just going to go through this. Um, in terms of, again, and just to contrast the outdoor spaces and, and what, what the digital photo diaries did was that sometimes something quite unrelated to activity or movement could, could be related or tweak people's feelings and sensibilities and reflections. And Diana talks about these images in her apartment that she saw. So she lives with these images, but all of a sudden in the context of the pandemic and in the context of doing this project, she saw something else in these images, which prompted her to participate in a, in a movement practice that she hadn't done in, in more than 23 years, she says. So that these, these assemblages of longing also have to do with a sense of our sense of history. And um, as I said, nostalgia kind of creeps in there as well. And the, the, the way that the pandemic has affected people's uh, relationships and ability to see family members also came out in the stories. So this young woman was walking and her mom didn't live in Sydney, um, but she always used to walk with her mom when her mom visited. So sometimes walking and, and seeing certain things would remind her of her mom and remind her of the fact that she couldn't see her mother in this time. So I, I'm thinking, I'm sort of working through this, I, this idea of longing and what it might do and what it might tell us. And, um, and I think that thinking with Deleuze, longing always emerges through a specific set of conditions. And we are definitely dealing with an extraordinary set of conditions right now. Um, but longing is felt and transformed and expressed through the moving body as it encounters the social material world. So you know, it's a very Deleuzean thing to say, what might something do? So instead of thinking so much about what people longed for, what does longing do? And in these brief examples, um, I'm thinking that longing was able to prompt new forms of bodily movement, new ways of connecting with people and spaces and places, new affective states, and new awareness and appreciation for outdoor environments. And I think it also, in some cases, um, prompted a heightened awareness and a sense of gratefulness for what people did have, which I think highlights perhaps what it might be like for other people who don't have these things. Um, so the specificities of longing are important as well. They illuminate important absences. So things like social connection, job security, comfortable housing, access to safe and pleasant green space. Um, they, all, they all emerge when we think through this idea of longing and that in turn highlight the material, economic and social contingency of health and well-being that sometimes gets eclipsed when we make sweeping statements like everyone should be active to you know, cope through the pandemic. Um, and I think that my findings, I'd like to elaborate the ways that they provide new frames for thinking about understanding a movement and physical activity beyond these generic understandings of health. Um, which are often related to the aesthetics of health and fitness and specifically in the context of COVID-19. And Ma how Marianne, they make... sorry to interrupt, but you've used 21 minutes now. Okay, this is my last sentence. How up. they may think, help us think um, about how we care for and support people and communities now and in post-pandemic futures. Thank you. Well, thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I'm very conscious of the time, but if there are any quick comments or questions uh, to Marianne's uh, paper. 
If not, let's keep moving. Um, our next uh, presenter is uh, joining us all the way from Denmark. Uh, what time is it there, Ian? Hello. Um, okay, you're sharing screen. Okay. Uh, and uh, he and his uh, co-author Signe Banke are at uh, the uh, in the business school at uh, Southern Denmark University, uh, and the title of their talk is "Unmaking and Remaking Music Festivals: Compressed Cultural Trauma." Rematerializations and responses to cultural loss. Ian. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Cool. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me, Eduardo, <coughs> Margaret, and Michael. <coughs> nice to see you and nice to be back in Australia. Yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, we're from Denmark. And, um, and uh, before that, of course, I was at Griffith University for a long time. Uh, um, and um, this, like Tally's paper, is a European comparative project, also funded through Horizon 2020 schemes by the Humanity, European Humanities Association. So there are five, five uh, partner universities and a range of partner um, of associate partners in the festivals industry. Um, Sudansk University, Southern Denmark, where I am, Erasmus with Palka Burkers, Limerick with Anne with Joe Haynes and uh, Jaglonian in Krakow with uh, Carolina Colemo. And then we have a range of postdocs and PhDs in the project as well. But this, this paper today is just some of the Danish data prepared with a PhD student on my part of the project, Sina Bunker. Uh, and I'll take you through it. Um, uh, first of all, you can see a nice uh, Twitter, Twitter to follow down there and also a nice blog website that we've got up and running. You should check that out if you're in the, to hear a bit more about the project. Um, but in pre preparing this, um, I've been thinking also a little bit with Freud to start with on trans. Um, and Freud writes this nice essay on, I can start theoretically, by the way, fairly theoretically in the beginning, lots of brilliant data in the middle, a little bit of theory at the end. So with me. Um, but Freud talks about going for a walk through a blossoming summer landscape in the company of a silent friend and a young and already known poet. A year later, the war broke up and robbed the world of beauty. It made the rest of the world remote once more. In this way, it robbed us so much of what we had loved and showed us the fragility of much that we had considered stable. So as a team, we were ready to, we had a brilliant plan as you do with these, with these grants to collect data through the summer, 20, summer of 2020. But like the rest of the world, uh, Denmark, uh, the prime minister of Denmark in early April said, no gatherings of over a thousand until September 1st. Of course, that number dropped, dropped, dropped and dropped as the, as the first wave hit. But effectively in early April, um, festivals were canceled um, for this year. So um, what do we do? Uh, the question is, how do we deal with this as researchers? And, and, and we decided that we needed to follow the field, basically, um, which is to follow the authors, follow the organizers, follow the entrepreneurs, follow the, follow the, follow the field of festivals and, and look at the response through 2020. Foundational theoretical frameworks. The paper title I proposed is quite elaborate and ambitious, but I still think the idea of social drama and cultural trauma a relevant understanding what's going on here. And this is a way in which I think I can frame this paper, which is a fairly macro take on looking at looking what ACT did in response to the cancellation of uh, festivals in 2020, at least in the Danish setting, also has some similarities to UK and the other, the other settings that we're studying. So that we can start with Alexander's ideas on drama, but I'm interested maybe in this idea of cultural trauma and this recent essay by De Mertzis and Eyman, which has updated their theory of cultural trauma. And the relevant here is, of course, just the trauma involves shattering, setting aside, setting, setting spaces for discursive understanding and assigning blame, et cetera, et cetera. But cultural trauma is anxiety and suffering, but also opportunity. The latter stems from the human capacity to adjust to new conditions, to remake the world as well as to live in it. And, and we take inspiration from this, or we, we do take some inspiration for this, uh, and look at processes of making and remaking uh, using uh, anthropological and material theories. Okay. Um, 
Randall Collins's work on solidarity, conflict, and shock is also relevant here. Empirically, uh, the paper then, um, this, th these ideas about trauma, these ideas about drama provide something of a theoretical context, but actually I think the empirical part of the paper I've started to realize as I've gone through analyzing this in the last couple of weeks, I think the concept of repair becomes really useful here because repair involves types of material practices and organizational practices, but repair is also something that happens within civil spheres. So I think um, what I'm trying to do with this paper is for the key actors, audiences, organizers, media, entrepreneurs who are part of festival culture and the festival business, the authorities and COVID-19 as an agent as well. In this paper, um, what I do is present data on the first three and maybe the first four of these actors. And what I do here is develop a sense of the um, COVID-19 festivals as an episode of drama trauma and looking at the way in which actors uh, respond. We have three festival partners. Uh, it's you know, useful for you to know a little bit about this. Um, one is Tuna Festival. Tuna is a town in the southwest of Denmark right on the German border. Um, and but they have a, a very good and well-renowned folk roots and blues festival. Uh, they're one of our partners that we work with closely. In the middle of Denmark on the island that I'm on uh, is another festival called Heartland, which has been around for five years, a commercial festival. Tuna is more of a community festival. Heartland is a, is a commercial festival. It's right in the middle of alternative indie the, uh, the, the bound around between alternative Indian mainstream musics, but they also have Nordic food cultures and they also have talks. Talks are a big feature. So this sort of new food intellectual things in, a sixth, in the surroundings of a 16th century castle. Um, it's worth noting people that get to talk at Heartland gives you a sense of what the festival's like. Um, Booth Butler, um, uh, Vivian Westwood, um, a huge, Huge names come and do talks, but also, um, also um, a lot of um, key music artists. Our third festival that we work with closely is, is called Distortion Festival. It's been around for over 20 years in Copenhagen. Distortion is famous, the famous street festival in Copenhagen. Started out small, has grown massive into a sort of a, an open street event with some added on uh, musical components. Data and methods, um, you know, interviewing organizers, interviewing audiences, netnographic study, and of course, extensive ethnographic and participant observation study of 2020 festival spaces and practices for these three festivals. So I go through the, heading toward the empirical parts of the paper, first of all, to give you a sense of all how audiences responded or are responding, um, and see some affinities with the data that, have, um, the data that uh, has already been presented in a couple of papers today. Yannick says to us, um, you know, my circadian rhythm has been really fucked up. It's not like I'm sitting up to shit o'clock at night um, and going to bed at eight or something uh, and getting up at six in the morning, I'm bored all the time. Christina says, well, there's no doubt that everything's bleeding a bit right now and that includes festivals. I think especially festivals are in people's blood. Uh, that is, um, that's those who go to festivals, that becomes like, it becomes like a family and we have to endure another year without that family. Let me just try and get rid of this, uh, uh, which I can't. Okay, audiences also, um, audiences also narrate Corona and the lack of festivals as a type of loss. Uh, Sarah says, all of a sudden, a weekend calendar is so very empty. All the birthdays and parties and new parties and concerts and rubbish, it's all canceled for sure. Sarah also says to us, yeah, she, she reflects on, on online events as a substitute, something that Ben, I, I remember mentioning in his project, uh, in his data. She says, yeah, of course, you try and do new parties and things like that, but it's not quite the same. The, the human side of it disappears. Um, it's funny, but in the long run, I think people miss that. They miss being physical together. So there's a reflection about the capacity festivals to be spaces where people are able to uh, be together this way. Audiences engage in a whole range of general practices uh, that, that, that they tell us. They're more hygienic, okay? They listen to festival 
Spotify playlists. They buy festival support packs, alcohol and various festival things that festivals put on sale to encourage people to do festivals at home. I have a couple of the young bands here and you'd be interested in this one. The orange one is of course for Ross Gilder and their motto this year was do it yourself. And the purple one is for Turner Festival. I support Turner Festival. These were, these were arm bands that people could buy for 20 bucks, 25 bucks. And they were ways of uh, contributing to the longevity and the survival of the festival. Watch the stream festival concerts, they invested in Better Home, Hi-Fi, et cetera, et cetera. You get the gist. Um, what we have, but is some amazing uh, ethnographic data about what audiences were doing to materially remake and create uh, festival um, atmospheres at home in their backyards um, or at camping sites with small groups of friends. So people here, audiences also go to, the, go to the trouble of basically making festival atmospheres at home, extending the boundary of the festival outside of the, uh, of the, of the original festival space, and in some ways repairing the loss, being with community and friends. And uh, our interviewee here says, fucking yes, we're just gonna have Heartland at home this year. This one is another example of a heartland recreation in the town of Mosland, which is nowhere near uh, heart where heartland is, but up, up outside Aarhus. Um, and these people made their own little, what they called, you can see uh, on the stage on the left, they made their own little musical stage where they had a live performance. It's called Heartland in Mosland. And again, this was about making a festival atmosphere. It's not just about having a party, but it's about making, um, having the right symbols, materials, things, space, atmosphere, to be able to cause something a little bit festival-like. So it's not just the fact that people want to have a party with, people, with, with others, but, but they want to have something that resembles the minds of a bit of a festival. And of course, this was done on the weekend of the festival. And the one in the middle, you can see that people put up a whole lot of signs. We have other data on this, which was other photograph data on this, also amazing. It says uh, sky bar up this way and food land down this way. So people go to the trouble of partitioning spaces that give them this feeling that they're in these festival zones. And, and our interviewer here says, yeah, it just wasn't an ordinary party. There was a real festival atmosphere to it. That's what was important. Media discourses nationally also promoted, um, promoted a sense of the loss of festivals in the Danish music and sort of the cultural landscape in 2020. So there was strong evidence that this was, um, this was something that mattered across the country. A couple of examples here. National media discourses generally support lost music festival narrative. This is one from the Danish uh, DSB, the Danish Railways. They have a new ad, or had, had an ad around this year that says, make new memories with your friends. And so this is a story of three guys starting off in the subways of Copenhagen or the subways, subway of Copenhagen and going to their own colony here, which is a little um, allotment garden, a summer house with a little garden attached to it. And basically these three guys have their own micro festival. Um, instead of going to a festival, they recreate the festival in their own little um, summer house. Another example is Good Morning Denmark. <clears throat> um, this, was, um, this was shown in May this year. They ran stories about the loss of the fest the loss that festival goers were experiencing. Mm -hmm. Farewell to festivals. This year, all the summer festivals are cancelled in the whole of Denmark. <clears throat> Notice the shot on the left hand side. These are just shots from a D. But if you look closely, you can see the interviewer. These are bits of festival material culture. Folding chairs, this ubiquitous folding chair that for some reason everybody in Denmark who goes to a festival has, it's the one you get. But there's gear, there's soccer balls, there's other bit, uh, there's a tent, there's other things which signify the festive assembly, which or the festival as a sort of a materially assembled um, event. Uh, Sina and I also, um, another example of the way in which national media were supporting this idea, of, were supporting this sort of interest and idea about loss of the festival. The Danish, uh, Danish national media, DR, Denmark's radio, ran a series of seven nationally televised live music events. Each of these events devoted to one music festival. I can see my... Can you hear the music? Yeah. Everybody? Yeah, good. 
um, this was these these was these Denmark's uh, national TV picked up on seven key festivals: so Roskilde, um, uh, Smukfest, um, Distortion, Tuna, and they ran these events which celebrated, mythologized, rated each event each event in its role in the Danish uh, music field, but also the Danish national fabric. And Sina and I were lucky enough to be uh, participate and observe and on one occasion in the audience, but on another occasion backstage. Um, we, we spoke to organizers as well, um, and they talk about wanting to give something back and not being able to. Andreas, one of the, one of the key organizers from Milan, says, just wanted to do something. I need to do something. I want to give something back. And my colleagues, we all have the same feeling. We want to give something back. How did they do it? It was difficult for them. Uh, Jana from Heartland reflects on the commercial imperative of making sure that people remember the festival. Will they come back next year? This is a problem for organizers. Maybe people decide that don't care about festivals anymore. They'd rather just go to a summer house and go off in their caravan. But she wants to, she wants to basically get guests to remember a uh, festival, keep it close to their heart. But so she wants to respect the commercial interests of the festival. She needs to, um, the sponsors in this case, because it's a commercial festival. And on one of the events we went to was this nice event where Heartland each year um, at the end of the festival, or probably in autumn, they plant all of these wildflowers. And the wildflowers then bloom um, next year, the year after rather, so that during the festival, you've got these nice fields uh, of wildflowers. Uh, and uh, on the day of uh, 30th of May and the 31st of May this year, you could come to the festival site and pick up the flowers, take them away, take them back to your home. This is some more ethnic shots of, um, of, of the wildflowers. Uh, this was sponsored by H&M, so the commercial interests here are also relevant. Um, uh, that that um, keeping, keeping the sponsors um, centre, at least for this festival, was important. Moving on to Distortion. Uh, Distortion is this big street festival in, uh, in Copenhagen, and they ran four events in Copenhagen over the four days the festival would have originally run. And this was preceded by postering of festival spaces. The festival, this, the, the logo that they used is really interesting, Eternal Sunday until, um, until June 21. These were placed around the district of Norobro where, um, where the festival runs. Oh, and another bit of music, but this also ran these sort of pop-up events, which animated the Corona city, if you like, gave a gift back, gave a gift back to the citizens of Norobro, um, um, reminded them about the festival and engaged them in an ironic way because Distortion is, a, is an anarchic sort of festival with crazy techno, crazy people, so to speak. Uh, Viking mentality is what they call it here. Um, but, but Distortion decided, yeah, we're going to give them a car on an old truck going across the bridge, or one of the bridges of Copenhagen. So this was a way of reminding people. And the way here was uh, DJ Raft on Slotsholm and then Fr Frederiksholm Canal in Copenhagen Harbour. I have more music. How much time have I got, Eduardo? Like five minutes, maybe? Sorry, I was on mute. Three, three or four minutes. Oh, how much time? Okay. Uh, and uh, you get the feel. They on a raft moving around Copenhagen Harbour, playing to people, giving away free beer, uh, bubbles, uh, disco balls, again, creating a uh, distortion atmosphere. This one is a really cool, creative way of working with Corona. A big band, a big Danish band, a European band, Who Made Who, play on Copenhagen, Copenhagen Harbour on the raft. And there are boats all around. You get the feeling. But this was a way of working with Corona and bringing it into the into a sort of makeshift festival site. The band plays on a raft. If there are ten people in a boat, if there are boats with ten people, this is legal. So, so festivals have got around it. Uh, got around the, um, the problem of Corona in some ways over summer 2020. Distortion in very creative ways. Tuna had garden parties. They invited people to have their own garden party in honor and in memory of the festival to help raise money. They had a support concert, and there was local entrepreneurial fundraising in support of the festival. What happened here? Um, I mean, maybe I'm starting to think that this is about, these are about processes of material and civil repair work. 
um, at, okay, it sounds disputed and sometimes partial, and there are different actors engaging in different ways, but processes of remembrance becoming important here for organizers and audiences. These remembrance are plural. They're sometimes about friends, sometimes about feelings, sometimes about spaces and times, They're sometimes contested because DR events, the Danish national media events were not universally accepted as representations of that festival. This was also about preserving and protecting partnerships, commercial partnerships, audiences, again, things and spaces. But it was about remaking, envisioning, making again, re-narrating. So this is about remaking the festival as a sort of a continuous process and making it with COVID-19. Here, we can think about the work of Graham Thrift on from a and I guess, or object studies. But I'm trying to think about the ways in which I can link this body of work to work on civil um, on civil repair in, in the more of a classical tradition in contemporary um, cultural sociology. Jeff Alexander's idea is about civil sphere and civil repair. But thinking about the festival as something that needed to be repaired, how is this done? It's done through these processes, maintenance and repair, which are materially, materially and spatially enacted by, by a range of actors. Um, cats in context, the Danish context is important, the particular, particular, particularities of our festivals are important, and also we need to think about um, festivals for the taste communities and with certain cultural style. This also guided their aesthetic response to, um, to the festival loss this year. We come back to Freud and we can think about the ways in Freud at the end of this essay says we'll once again build up everything that the war has destroyed, right, he wrote this in 1970 perhaps on the foundations and more lastingly than before. Festival organizers are um, now reflecting hard on how they uh, change their festival for 21. Indeed, if they have a festival, they've used this time to think about um, rebuilding and remaking the festival in particular ways. In discussion, you know, these themes of remaking and repair come up in the context of uh, trauma. Okay. Tuck. No, thank, thank you. And uh, look, I just want to say here uh, quickly that um, we haven't uh, been cut off. So uh, perhaps we can spend a little bit of time uh, backtracking as well, because I saw in the chat thread that there were also questions for previous speakers. But uh, first of all, does anyone have any questions or comments for Ian? I have a question. Hi, Tell. Hi, nice to see you. I was wondering. Um, I, I was really interested in in uh, the the uh, the need, the strong need for continuity. I think you called it uh, preserving and protecting. And I was yeah. wondering what uh, what you think the the main motivation is. I mean, on the one hand, you could say, okay, there's one summer that's out. We can't have the festivals. Okay, next summer we'll be back in business. Why, why do you think um, the organizers, the audiences, uh, the artists feel this very strong urge for continuity as if their lives depended on it? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's commercial interests. So there are different motivations exactly. depending on each of these festivals as well. So for some of them, there is a commercial interest and not in not going under. So these fundraising activities have to go on. If they don't go on, then the festival will lose millions. And, and so communities come together to try and engage in these processes of commercial repair. Also, just a practical thing, people have this week or two of summer holidays where they go to the town and, and, get, and, and camp and have a festival, or they go to friends in Copenhagen and spend time at the festival or elsewhere in Denmark. So in a sense, a practical thing about holidays, people booked in their holidays with their friends, then they, uh, they, the festival doesn't even no longer exist. Uh, so they, but they, but they, in various ways, creative ways, um, remake it in their backyards or in camping sites and stuff like that. So I guess this partly, there are different motivations. There are also the motivations of organizers as well to, to, to give something back, but also again, to make sure that, well, well, if I want, we want to make sure that people come back in 21, if indeed there is a festival. So there's a range of different motivations um, around, I mean, yeah, around remembering and repair, I guess. Um, but, but I think remembering for me becomes an important theme in this context. But, uh, but I think I want to also 
what I wanted to try and do with the paper is to show the multiplicity of, um, of motivations. Um, yeah. Other questions? Can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. uh, <clears throat> hi, Ian. Hi. Great beard, like it. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I Thank think with, with the kind of festival thing, I mean, you know, the phrase people want to carry on as if their lives depend on it. In some ways, I, I, you know, I don't want to kind of trivialize the economic thing, but at the kind of cultural level, one might actually say it's, you know, lives do depend on it, not in the biological sense, but in the kind of cultural, sensorial, you know, kind of aesthetic sense. It's a part of mm -hmm. who people are, isn't it? So, you know, I, I'm not I'm not familiar that much with Alexander's notion of civil repair, but does that play into the idea of, you know, people carrying on with things because it makes life bearable and, you know, social and what have you? Um, I guess so, but I guess these processes of civil repair are about, about reforging solidarities, about dealing with problems mm -hmm. and uh, creating conditions by which yeah, societies can return to normal or problems within societies can be fixed. Um, and in this sense, I think this response to keep festivals alive and animated becomes a type of response to, uh, to keep them alive. As if it, acting as if the, or, or acting as if lives depended on it, um, I mean, acting as if communities depended on it, acting as if friendships depended on it, acting as if spaces and places depended on it, yes. Um, so I think, I think this is what people are doing. They're mobilizing in response to this threat and, and, and doing their best to make sure that these festivals return in a reasonable state in 21. Yeah. So this is, in this sense, I think it, you can talk about it as a process of civil repair, but which is materially engaged by these various practices. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Can I can I just jump in for a moment? Um, that's a great a great piece of research, um, Ian. I really loved it, and it's so nice to see you on screen um, wow. and to connect again. Um, I, it's really I'm I'm interested in this idea of remembering, and and I was thinking about your paper, and also thinking about Marianne's paper as well, which is about seems to be have involved ideas around remembering. But I was thinking about. Um, your connection with with Freud and this idea of mourning, not as relinquishment, yeah. but as a remaking or a form of repair, which I think is very, is obviously, you know, very deeply within psychoanalysis, um, although yeah. it's not thought about in that way. Um, it's often, you know, wrongly thought as a kind of letting go without the idea of remembering. Um, but yeah. I was thinking about these festivals that are all these activities of trying to re sort of return to the festival in these new ways in COVID or re reinvigorate um, the memory of what the festivals used to be, but what people yes. have to do now. And the kind of doubling then that goes on because in that reinvention, people are remembering what it was before COVID, but they're also then yep. creating a trace of a kind of memory of COVID. And I wonder whether that doubling over time whether that doubling will last I suppose like will people in the future talk about oh remember do you remember what we had to do to create the idea of a festival during COVID <laughs> and whether that will have its own force I guess so yeah. I that yeah. the other thing I want to say and this is to Marion um I was thinking when you were talking about your interviewees talking about how they felt like their bodies were aching and the ways that they kind of were remembering how their bodies used to feel before they kind of went into lockdown and couldn't exercise so much and their bodies were kind of communicating this kind of sense of loss of how they felt in their bodies but and then connecting that to the I think it was a a story by Diane who said she took up karate again and then realized that in some way she her body remembered how to do that and so there's these really interesting themes around remembering and forgetting and how the body can remember or how we kind of um you know just these interesting themes I think that I, I sort of felt across those two papers and I loved both of them thanks Margaret I mean, I, I can, do we want to, no, do we want to comment? I was just going to say thank you. That idea of remembering and loss and sort of histories 
histories that are now present and, and potential futures is really interesting and it's coming out. So that is, um, I'll definitely keep that in mind as I wade my way through this data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, from festivals, yeah, um, in the immediate future, if they go on next year, whatever way they go, go on in 21, but, but probably in 22 as well, you know, whole ideas about hygiene and spacing are still going to remain important. Um, but I mean, our research this year has looked at the really mundane ways that people make these festival atmospheres. The concept of atmosphere has really been designing an atmosphere. And maybe here we also work with this idea of textures as well. But atmosphere has become, a, become an important sort of theme for us to, to understand what people are trying to, what, what they're trying to focus on. So this partitioning of space, this bringing in of certain objects, this bringing in, of, bringing in of certain festival practices, I think, yeah, it's a way of remembering and keeping alive. But Margaret, I mean, you... Yeah, you, this is a nice point you, you bring up. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. I loved it. I loved your paper. Yeah. Uh, Ma Marianne, the, there was also a question in the chat thread. I don't know if you saw it. Um, someone wanted to know the technologies that uh, you're employing in the uh, photo diaries. Mm. Sorry, <laughs> I responded to that person. Um, oh, good. <laughs> and I, I, I actually had to use a Qualtrics form to comply with UNSW data storage protocols, uh -huh. which was a little bit too bad because Qualtrics is quite clunky. It's not that aesthetic, um, but I was trying to get this product off the ground quickly to make it timely. Um, so anyways, yes, I used a Qualtrics form, but I, I wanted to use a Google, even a Google Doc or a Google form even a Microsoft form, but I had UNSW said no. <laughs> so that's what I use. And then I emailed a link every day and invited people to upload a photo and share their story with me. Within the uh, spaces that you deal with in your research, um, I wanted to just briefly ask you about the beach. You might've noticed, uh, you said you arrived um, just before COVID hit that, um, uh, there were closures of beaches in Sydney, which was deemed to be, you know, uh, absolute an absolute anathema, of course, to the Australian way of life. But I noticed that uh, subsequently the international media, whenever they want to capture an image of irresponsible COVID behaviour, they will show you an image of, you know, young, young people in Florida or Ibiza or whatever, uh, and somehow the second wave or whatever has something to do with beach behavior. So is, is there something about movement and the beach that you think is really being manifested here? Oh, definitely. I think the beach is a really, um, I think the beach is a fascinating place that's been played out. It's been rolled out really interestingly in social media. So Bondi Beach, of course, was all over the news um, at the in the early stages of the pandemic. And I think that the beach is such a, it occupies such an imaginary bodies and beaches, right? They go, they go hand in hand. And so definitely, I think that the media is having a heyday with that. Um, yeah, it's interesting that they're that they're singled out, especially because you know the outdoors is supposed to be safer than the indoors. Um, but I wrote a piece for it's, Media it's, International Australia on that very thing at the, in the early stages of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But it'll be interesting to see what happens this summer in Sydney um, as as we go through this. I don't know if we're in the second wave or how we manage this, these next few months. It's the same here, actually. The beach is also um, a zone of contention, if you like. The lakes of Copenhagen, the beaches on the edge of Copenhagen, these are also highlighted as these sort of uh, danger zones in relation to COVID. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, very. Well, it is a liminal zone between culture and nature, isn't it? A kind of classic one. Yeah. Mm. Look, look, yeah, Andy, did you want to say something there? No, okay. Look, if there are no further comments, we've gone 13 minutes over time, which is always a good sign. I have to say I've really enjoyed and been very stimulated by the all the presentations and uh, there was just such unexpected connections between 
all the presentations, but also the fantastic questions that people have thrown at our speakers. So uh, look, I, uh, speaking personally, look forward to seeing what uh, are the fruits of all this research. And uh, I hope we can all stay in touch in some shape or form. So please do let us know when this research gets published. Thank you. No, thank you. Thanks, all. Thank you. all right. Thanks, Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.